All right, let's go to John 13. Um, last time I taught, we finished up John 12. Now we're going to get into John 13. We're going to look at verses 1 through 17 today. Um, chapter 13 begins Jesus' farewell discourse. Now, Jesus' farewell discourse runs all the way to the end of uh, John's, uh, John 17. So John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 is Jesus' farewell discourse. Now, a farewell discourse is that last kind of speech you give before you die. Right? It's the... It's, you're communicating to those that you're leaving behind important truths you want them to get. Don't miss kind of somebody's last words, if you will. Um, we see Jacob's farewell discourse in Genesis 47 through 49. Joshua's farewell discourse to Israel in uh, Joshua 20 through 2 through 24. David's farewell speech in 1 Chronicles 28 through 29. And then the entire book of Deuteronomy can be looked at as Moses' farewell discourse. Again, so it's the last thing that they're saying before they die. In regards to Jacob's, you remember he brings all of his sons together and that's when he, he does that in Genesis 47 through 49. Now the theme of the first part of Jesus's farewell discourse is humble service and that's what we're going to see in this text today. So there's kind of two themes in John, John 13 1 through 17. The first is humble service and the second is the the process of justification and sanctification. Okay, main theme, don't miss it. He's getting across to his disciples at the beginning of his farewell discourse, humble service. Secondary theme, he teaches them the relationship between uh, justification and sanctification. So that's what we're going to see today. Um, John brings forward to his readers a picture of the King of Kings, God himself kneeling before his creation as he washes their feet. So he's bringing forward this, the king of kings, the creator of the universe, is kneeling at the feet of his creation. And it's a picture. There's so many things that we can pull from this. But we see the gospel in it as well. We see a picture of the gospel in, in the nature of it, where God comes down to serve his creation. Now, the response of the submissive service that Jesus provides in this is a model then for his disciples to turn around and serve others the same way. That's the main theme of it, all right? Um, he, calls his, he calls his disciples in this, and we're going to see it with Peter, Receive this humble service that I'm giving you. Receive it. Then turn around and do it to others. So in verses 1, or in verse 1, we're going to see the heart of the humble servant. In verse 2 through 11, we're going to see the example of the humble servant. And in verses 12 through 13, 17, we're going to see the command of the humble servant. I am going to speed up my speech to get you out of this oven quicker. So follow along. Got it? Verse 1. We'll go this bit by bit. Verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So the context. Now before the feast of Passover. Everybody in this room understands what they're celebrating, right? Passover. Everybody understands that, right? That's the event in the Old Testament out of Egypt, slain, sacrificing the lamb, covering the blood on the doorpost. Okay, so we're looking for the heart of the humble servant here. As I was studying this, I thought of 3D glasses. You put on 3D glasses to reveal something that's not, that you can't see without them. Does that make sense? Crisis is like a pair of 3D glasses. Crisis in, in, in someone's life is like a pair of 3D glasses in that it reveals the heart. And what's in the heart? When crisis comes, 
It reveals like a pair of 3D glasses that you can't see unless you have it. Crisis reveals the heart. Uh, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said, that, well, first of all, death, imminent death, the ultimate crisis is the ultimate revealer of the heart. <clears throat> Charles Spurgeon said, in the light of a man's death, we shall see what power really ruled him. So again, the, the premise is the crisis of death will reveal the heart and reveal what power ruled him. As we see the crisis of the cross, remember Jesus is hours away from the cross now. The crisis of death revealing crisis of the cross revealing his heart and his heart is filled with love for his own having loved his own who were in the world he loved them to the end so the crisis of the cross is revealing love but do not miss where that love is directed what's the text say having loved his own So when you take a step back and you think about that, his own, that, that means he, he possesses, he owns them. They're, they're his. He's talking about people, right? Pr primarily the disciples, secondarily the church, of believers throughout history. Uh, but the question is, as, I, as I've read through this and chewed on this, how did we become his own? Because if we're born into sin, if our nature is that of sin, the Bible tells us that, that we're actually children of wrath, children of the devil. We need to be redeemed out of that relationship and then we become his own, right? His sheep. We talked about this several months ago with John 6, 37. He says, all that the Father gives me, there you go. There's the moment in which we become Jesus's. Does that make sense? John 6, 37 finishes, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. The Father gave them to the Son. That's how we become His. John 10, 27 through 29, he says, My sheep, again, notice the possession there. They're His sheep. Hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, there you go. That's how we'll become Jesus' own. What's amazing is that such a great love was directed to such incompetent people. I mean, the disciples are not the sharpest knives in the drawer. I'll throw myself in that bucket too. But that love is directed towards them, those that the Father gives to him. And he kept loving them to the end. I mean, don't miss the reality of Peter and this with Peter and the denial and everything. I mean, never once was there hate towards his disciples, his own sheep, anger, frustration, weariness. There was never lukewarmness in Jesus' heart towards his disciples. Love them to the end. Now there was one in their midst that was not his own. That was not, that the Father did not take out of the darkness and give to the Son. And that's what we learn to see in verse 2. So in verse 2 now, 2 through 11, we're going to see the example of the humble servant. I'll read verse 2 and 3 first. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Notice John, the gospel writer here, is intentional in informing his readers that Judas was already bent towards betraying Christ. Done. It wasn't Jesus washed his feet and then the devil put it into the... No, the devil had already... Why is that important? Well, Jesus washed his feet. Yet again, an even greater picture of his humble servants, the creator of the universe coming and washing the feet of the one who was going to betray him, knowing that he was going to betray him. 
yet Jesus washes his feet. Do you notice whose feet never got washed? Christ's. The disciples didn't think to turn around, at least we don't know, until we wash your feet. But Judas got his feet washed. Notice also we see the deity of Christ very clearly, his origin in verse 3. You cannot deny Christ's deity. He's God. How do we see that in verse 3? Where did he come from? Verse 3 tells us, and the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and going back to God. His origin was heaven. Amen? All right. Now, before we move to verse 4 through 11, this, this is another thing that blew my mind. If the cross, if I knew I was going to the cross in a couple of hours, if you knew you were going to the cross in a couple of hours, that you would be beaten, spit on, that you would be whipped so badly that flesh would be torn off your body and bone would be exposed, that you would be nailed to the cross and that you would shortly die of asphyxiation, asphyxiation, suffocation, right? What do you do in a couple of hours before that? What do you do in the night before that? Besides trying to run away and figuring out a way to get out of it, right? I'm not washing feet. He is. And so what does he do? Verse 4. Rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. We'll stop there. So we understand the whole dynamic of the foot washing, the need for it, why it was happening, right? Everybody walked everywhere they went back during this time. They had dirt paths, they had sandals, everybody's feet was nasty, and they sat on the floor and they had dinner together. You didn't want to sit on the floor next to somebody who has stinky, nasty, dirty feet. So they would have the lowliest servant come in and perform that nasty job. That was the lowliest servant. In fact, the Jews didn't do that because they felt it was such a disgrace. Jesus performs that job of the lowliest, lowliest servant. Earlier, Jesus had said to the disciples, the greatest among you shall be your servant. We see a partial fulfillment of that right here. Who's the greatest among the disciples when he's saying that? He is, right? So we see a partial fulfillment in that. The greatest among you shall be your servant. But the ultimate fulfillment, of course, is the cross, right? Because he is serving them by taking the punishment they deserve for their sins on the cross so that they can be forgiven and given eternal life. He's, that's, the ultimate, that's the ultimate fulfillment of him saying, the greatest among you shall be your servant. So the creator of the universe, washing the stanky feet of the disciples, even the stanky feet of the one who was going to betray him. Mind-blowing to me. Peter understood the profoundness of this. Verse 6. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Peter's like, wait a minute. This isn't computing in my mind. I'm the inferior. I'm to serve the superior. This is what Peter's thinking. This isn't right. Inferior is supposed to serve the superior. Peter can't figure it out. He gets it. He got that dynamic, but he missed the reality that he probably shouldn't have told Christ what to do. He does that quite a bit. But he got it. Jesus responds, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but
but afterwards you will understand. The afterward Jesus is referring to is after the foot washing when he explains it here in verses 12 to 17, which is the command to them to humbly do what he does, what he did as a servant. But Peter's comment in verse 8 says, you should never wash my feet. He understood it, but he didn't get the dynamic here. Jesus' response here and serves two purposes. In verse 10, Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. So what is going on in verse 10? Jesus' point he has two purposes. The first purpose is it corrects Peter's misunderstanding of Christ's messianic mission. He corrects his faulty inferior is to serve the superior. No, the gospel is the superior Christ came and served the inferior sinners like us. So he, he corrects Peter's misunderstanding of what the Messiah was to do here. And then the second purpose is to teach the truth. He takes this physical reality of physically washing feet and taking baths and connects it and uses it to teach the spiritual reality of justification and sanctification. So he says in verse 10, the one who is bathed does not need washed. The one who is bathed is the one who has been justified, who has been spiritually clean, bathed by the blood of Christ through faith in him as King, Messiah, Lord. He's bathed. You don't need to jump in the bath and get rebathed again or rejustified again or re resaved again. Once you've been bathed by the blood of Christ, justified, faith has been given. You have believed on the Lord Jesus. You are bathed. You are spiritually cleansed. That's the point. So that's justification. But we still are knuckleheads, right? We still sin. We have to repent, turn, and follow the Lord. Our feet get dirty spiritually as we sin and we go down a path that the Lord as the good shepherd comes as, and rescues the sheep. We repent. Our feet get dirty. So that just a sanctification process is the feet washing. We've been bathed, but we still need our feet washed. That's the point because of justification. We've been justified with the bath, spiritually wiped clean, but we still do sin and our feet get dirty. We need to repent, turn, and that's what he's talking about. Amen? Amen. This is beautiful. And it's inside this justification, sanctification truth is, is inside of this beautiful reality of him calling us to humble service too. It's so beautiful. So that's what's going on there. Justification, sanctification. But there is one amongst that group it's not clean. He doesn't just have dirty feet, but he hasn't bathed either. He's dirty. Who's that? It's Judas. Abundantly clear. He's not. Not, not justified. Not saved. He is dirty. And then we see... That's, that's, at, that's at the end of verse 11. Or verse 11. For, we knew, for he knew who was to betray him. That, and that's why he said, not all of you are clean. Now in verse 12 through 17, we'll finish off the command of the humble servant. 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. For so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So although Jesus taught justification and sanctification in these verses, the main point of these verses is humble service to others. Who's the one another here that we're to wash their feet? Humbly serve them. Who's the one another? Believers. believers. That's the context. That's what he's teaching. We're to be doing that with other believers. Humbly serving, washing their feet. So to not follow the Lord's command 
And to not serve others in humility and love is to pridefully elevate oneself above others and even above Christ. Because Christ says, if the Master has done it and you refuse to do it, then that's what you're doing. You're, you're elevating yourself above the, the Master. That makes no sense. You would follow the Master. But then he says, you're blessed not by knowing this, verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. There's actions. Actions speak louder than words. The command isn't to know it. The command is to do it. Other Christians. Amen? All right, so in this very pop, very famous, very well-known passage of Jesus washing the feet, he's calling his disciples to humble service to one another, other Christians, but also teaching the reality of justification. Once you're bathed, once you're saved, you don't need another bath, guys. You don't need to be resaved. You are. Either you are or you ain't. But you do need your feet washed. You do need that sanctification, that repentance, that, that turning from sin. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, what a beautiful um, example that you've given us in, in this text. Um, and such a deep truth around the fact that once we're bathed, once we're saved, we don't need another bath. We're saved. But we do need our feet washed and we need to repent and turn from sin and be sanctified. Thank you for that. Pro Thank you for your patience with us in that process. And so, Lord, I ask that you would give us two things, that you would give us a heart for that humble service to other believers um, in that foot washing as the primary theme there, but also secondarily, Lord, that you would give us the wisdom and patience that you um, give us personally, that you would give us patience for others who need their feet washed, um, who need to be called to repentance and loved um, and not cut, but loved by calling them to repent and by your Holy Spirit, Lord, we trust that that will happen uh, for the ones that are yours. Uh, Lord, continue to protect this ministry. Uh, use it for your glory, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.